Realm presents Orphan Black, The Next Chapter, starring Tatiana Maslany. Episode 3. The damp, smoky smell of the grit wreckage reminded Sergeant Jayasara Priyanta of the whiskey her father brought out on special occasions. Like him, she'd never made alcohol a regular habit, but on this chill morning, as her gloved hands pried a warped metal filing drawer open to find nothing but a dusting of ashes, a stiff drink was sounding good. It was fortunate, at least, that the RCMP had gotten in right after the blast last night. Explosions, by their nature, had a way of scattering evidence. But the constables had managed to find potential bomb fragments and even some fresh blood right before the skies had opened and the night's hammering rain had washed away hope of further breakthroughs. The blood likely belonged to Dr. Nathaniel Sturgis, director of research, the only person reportedly in the building at the time of the explosion. It was unclear if he'd been an intentional target. Neither he nor his remains had been found. Jessera stood and stretched, cracking her back. Even at her full height, she felt dwarfed by the shattered building. She'd never been the most imposing person on the force, but in this grim context, she felt particularly small and more than a little helpless, especially in the face of confusing evidence. The fragments of steel pipe they recovered suggested the sort of device a low-resourced agitator might have put together after a trip to a home improvement supply store. But even if the RCMP hadn't already received a cryptic inquiry from the U.S. government official about the incident, Jayasara would have had second thoughts based on the physical evidence. When extremists got angry enough to blow things up, they usually aimed to take out people. This bomb hadn't been mailed or placed in a public access area to go off during the day. It had gone off deep in a restricted access area near a lab in the dead of night. Plus, the blast had been hot and huge. Nearly half of the building had been damaged. Homemade pipe bombs just didn't work that well. And there had been no warning, no manifesto. That the whole thing might have been an accident hadn't been ruled out by the engineers they'd called in. When it came to the type of science this facility conducted, Jessica was in way over her head. She'd never heard of anything biological spontaneously exploding in a way that would cause this sort of damage. But she wasn't sure what chemicals they might use to preserve specimens or clean equipment. Given how deserted the building had been at that hour, an unattended chemical leak wasn't out of the question, and the steel pipe fragments could have been coincidental. To Jessica, though, the evidence hinted at premeditated expertise. Certain file drawers near the center of the blast appeared to have been emptied before the bomb went off, and the explosion was perfectly placed to wipe out electronic data. Add that to the fact that they'd had no luck recovering security footage, and she simply couldn't rest easy with the idea of an accident, or with moving too quickly to blame it all on some violent but amateurish anti-biotech extremist. Constable Reynaud's movement in Jayasara's periphery caught her attention, and she swiveled toward the lanky man and frowned. Where are your gloves, Reno? He shrugged and gestured to the damp remains of the evidence. I think we're past being delicate at this point, Jay. She'd asked everyone on the force to call her Jay because she was tired of hearing her name mispronounced. Procedure, she reminded Reno. And to his credit, he did his best to stifle his eye roll as he hunted for his gloves. A muted ding from Jayasara's phone alerted her to a new message, so she stepped away and removed one of her own gloves to check it. The results from the blood sample were back already. Since Sturgis's DNA wasn't likely to be on file with law enforcement agencies, she hadn't been expecting results at all, so this was good news. Or not. Who the hell is Katya Obinger? She said aloud to the screen. The jingling of keys cut through the droning of TV news in the next room and drew Kasima's attention from the student paper she was making notes on at the kitchen island. Delphine was on her way out the door, running late to her bio-threat meeting, where she'd be playing ethics consultant to a bunch of government suits. Bye, I guess, Kasima said, setting down her old-school red pen. Ah, 
Delphine snapped out of whatever reverie she'd gotten lost in and turned back toward the kitchen. I'm sorry, I thought we had already said goodbye. Nope, said Cosima. She didn't rise from her chair, stubbornly making Delphine come back and bend to kiss her. Delphine smelled so good that Cosima's annoyance faltered. At the last minute, she returned the embrace. Delphine lingered. I promise I'll see what I can find out about Grit at the meeting. Are you all right? I'm worried about how calmly you're taking this. It makes me think you have some sort of plan. Plan? Cosima's mm. phone dinged, a new text message, but she ignored it, locking eyes with her wife. To get involved, said Delphine. It isn't your nature to sit still in a crisis. Cosima flashed Delphine a brittle smile. That's what you want me to do, though, right? Be a good girl and let the grown-ups handle it? That isn't what I... It's fine. The only devious plan I have is to keep one eye on the news while I grade papers. Have fun fighting for justice or whatever. She couldn't meet Delphine's eyes. Delphine took a breath as though to reply, but instead just exhaled and laid a hand on Cosima's hair before heading out the door. Cosima picked up her phone. The text was from Kira. I'm okay. Please don't tell mom I'm not staying with you. I'll explain later. Cosima sighed and texted back. How about now? Mm. Kira's reply was almost immediate. I'm doing something important and safe. Please just be cool about this. Cosima remembered being a teenager well enough to know that if she wasn't cool, Kira would stop confiding in her, so she sent a grudging okay. There was a new email, too. A student with an excuse for needing extra time on a paper. Would it be okay if I did something other than the assigned topic? I had this great idea last night. While you were high, Cosima finished for him, closing the email without replying. This morning of all mornings, Cosima really didn't need the reminder that she might be doomed to a constant slow drip of this exact kind of irritation for the rest of her life. Sturgis had tried to offer something more, and she'd recoiled, rightly, but it didn't make the stack of grading in front of her any less mind-numbing. She pushed the papers away and rose from her chair to pace the kitchen a few times, phone in hand, before wandering to the shared home office. The office was one of the draftiest rooms at the moment, and so she preferred to work in the kitchen when she didn't need the computer. She yanked a sweater off the back of her chair and pulled it on as she opened her browser and hit her bookmark for the Spare a Dime fundraiser Charlotte had found the night before. She couldn't do anything about what had happened at Grit, but she could toss a few bucks to a sick clone while she and Charlotte figured out some better way to help her. The page was gone. A dead link. Cosima backed up to the main site and searched, but pulled up no results. It was as though the page had never been there. An uneasy feeling crawled up Cosima's spine. Maybe Charlotte knew a way to find the page. Cosima was halfway to the basement door before she doubled back. Last night had been rough on the poor girl. It would be best to let her get dressed and chug some caffeine before dropping a fresh load of bummer in her lap. She started a text message instead. Hey, find me whenever you're... But an incoming call took over her screen before she could finish. She didn't recognize the number, but something prodded her to pick up. Yes? Cosima Niehaus? Said a male voice. Five syllables wasn't enough for Cosima to identify him. Can I help you? It's me. Me who? Nathaniel Sturgis. Holy shit. Cosima turned on her heel, heading back into the living room where she could pace better. Everyone thinks you're in a thousand charred pieces, she said. She glanced at the TV, but they were talking about the latest tropical storm that was about to devastate the U.S. It might be better if everyone thinks I'm dead for now. Yep, definitely Sturgis. He laid on the drama pretty thick when they met in his office, too. What the hell happened? I can't tell you over the phone. It's not a secure line. I need you to meet me ASAP. How are we supposed to set up a meeting on an insecure line? You literally just said both of our full names. There was a brief silence. Then, meet me at my happy place. Your what? At least Sturgis had the self-awareness to sound uncomfortable when he had to repeat it. You know, my, uh, happy place. Happy. Happy. 
the one near the place I work, used to work. Make sure you're not followed. And he hung up. Kasima stared at the phone for a moment, then called the number back. She got a message telling her that the user hadn't set up voicemail. Damn it, Sturgis, how am I supposed to... Wait, wasn't there a pub right around the corner from Grit called The Happy Helix? That must be it. There was no way he'd expect her to know his actual favorite spot. She'd have to at least check the Helix. This was exactly the sort of thing Delphine was afraid she'd do, and that knowledge didn't improve her mood one bit. Easy for Delphine to talk about staying out of danger when she wasn't the one whose genome attracted trouble like flies. Her wife was just going to have to forgive her, because right now, she sure as hell wasn't in the mood to ask permission. Delphine managed to make it to the biothreat meeting on time, barely, but everyone else was already in the middle of a raging argument. All nine of the attending members of the task force turned to look at her as though she'd arrived late. She took her seat in the bland conference room and tried to be unobtrusive, to listen in and catch up while remaining fully cognizant of her role as barely tolerated recent consultant to the long-running task force. She'd barely slept, and although English was second nature to her by now, sleep deprivation made it hard to keep track of the jargon bouncing back and forth. The best she could glean was that the senior members of the task force, a group overwhelmingly composed of old white men whose names and faces Delphine had trouble keeping straight, wanted to stick to the original meeting's agenda, a discussion of the threat posed by Gilles Sauveterre's Québécois separatist group. The other half of the room seemed to want to shift focus entirely to the grit explosion, and for Delphine's purposes, that was promising. It's not even an agenda change said a bald man whose name Delphine had forgotten, but who represented the RCMP. As far as I'm concerned, the incident is recent activity by Sauveterre. He has a history of ill will against Grit, and we know he's been in Toronto over the past week, even though it's rare for him to leave Quebec. How certain are you? Wheezed an old man who looked as though he had one foot in the grave. Certain enough for me to have wasted two weeks of my life learning everything there is to know about salmon for this meeting? The salmon farm incident is still relevant, cut in the smoky voice of Lieutenant General Eloise Thibault. She was a grizzled, hard-edged French-Canadian veteran who always smelled ever so slightly of cigar smoke. Delphine knew this because, as the only two women in the room, they tended to sit near one another. I know it's been a while, but don't forget it was grit that helped develop the strain of genetically modified fish that got into Sauveterre's precious stream and started him down this crazy path to begin with. Everything about this points to him. The table seemed to consider this information for a moment. Delphine seized the brief silence as an opportunity to put in her own question. Is there any new information on Dr. Sturgis? Lieutenant General Thibault swiveled toward Delphine and furrowed her brow. Who? She said bluntly. The director of research, Nathaniel Sturgis, said Delphine. The man presumed dead in the attack. It seems possible that he was the target, and so I was curious if anyone might have some idea why. At the look she was receiving, she added the justification. If his work itself represented a potential biological threat, then of course that is relevant to the concerns of the task force. You've made a very strange leap of logic there, said Greg Kurtzman. The young MIT grad on Thibault's other side rarely spoke in meetings, but he'd seemed to take a dislike to Delphine right off the bat, never resisting the chance to undermine her. What led you to that theory? Delphine internally cringed. She'd been too focused on getting information for Cosima. She should have been subtler. Would have been, years ago. This kind of maneuvering had long ago ceased to be part of her daily routine. Why is she floating theories in the first place? spoke up another Ministry of Defense rep from across the table before she could answer, older than Kurtzman, white and gray-haired like so many of them. Isn't she just here to be our little ethics gadfly? Once again, Delphine's attempt at speaking was cut off by another man on her right. My agency's obvious concern, he said, as though she'd never even spoken, is the border security element. I know supposedly Sauveterre only cares about his little inbred clan of francophone yokels, No offense, Lieutenant General. Thibault gave him a flat stare. The apology is more offensive than the comment, Jones. At any rate, 
Jones went on. We have evidence that Gilles was in Toronto three days ago meeting with known agents of extremist anti-biotech group 46 Pure. If you're not familiar with 46 Pure, Jones huffed, eyeing Delphine. They have members in at least three countries, and I just heard that the blood of a German national was found at the scene. This is an international incident, ladies and gentlemen. Immediate implementation of biometric screening at the borders is the only way to keep track of these people and make sure more of them don't come in and the ones here don't escape. The bald RCMP rep said something irritably to Jones that Delphine didn't even hear. She felt as though someone had poured cold water down her spine at the phrase biometric screening. Biometric security was very, very bad news for clones. My thought, said Thibault, is that biometrics would also be an excellent way to identify any of Sauveterre's clan who are trying to hide out in the city. They're all related to each other two or three times over. I'm sorry to interrupt again, Delphine said. But did you say you're considering stopping Canadian citizens at borders to test their DNA? And I've missed where Germany came into this. Here's the problem with going off book, spoke up the oldest man in his wheezing voice. The original agenda was approved for everyone invited. Now we're openly discussing sensitive details of an ongoing law enforcement investigation in front of the consultant. The way he said consultant as he gestured at Delphine made it sound like a stand-in for a much less polite word. My thoughts exactly, said Kurtzman. I say we keep to the original agenda for now and arrange another meeting to discuss the more sensitive information. No said Thibault. For once, Jones and Valcour bothered to show up. We're discussing it all now. For heaven's sake, said the bald man, Valcour. Just send Cormier home, the bald man said, so we can get on with this. Delphine waited for someone to object, but they all turned to look at her expectantly. Her face burned. It's not personal said Jones, his tone implying she was a child in danger of a tantrum. But time is short, the matter is urgent and not for civilian ears. All right, she said stiffly. She rose from her chair, trying to suppress her surge of frustration. She needed to be here for this. But if she didn't play nice, they could permanently remove her from the table just as easily as they'd added her in the spring. You know how to reach me if something comes up that could benefit from my assessment. The room fell silent as she left. Her shoes sounded too loud on the glossy laminate flooring. Letting the door drift close behind her, she made a beeline down the hall for the elevator. It was an old building with slow machinery. She stood waiting for what felt like an eternity in the dim hallway before she was surprised by the echo of approaching footsteps. Est-ce que vous allez bien? said Thibault from down the hall. French wasn't necessary, but Delphine found herself grateful. Oui, she answered, and then continued in French, hoping to cultivate a feeling of solidarity. Surely they didn't send you out of the meeting too, Lieutenant General. One corner of Thibault's mouth quirked upward in what looked almost like a smile. In the half-dozen bio-threat meetings Delphine had attended, she wasn't sure she'd ever seen the woman's face do that. Call me Eloise. Her French had a pleasantly rural, old-fashioned quality to Delphine's ear, even more so than most Canadians. And just let them try that. No, I stepped out to make a point. They're still arguing in the same circles. I'm glad I caught you, though. I want to address the elephant in that room. Which is? At least three of the men in there don't want an ethics consultant at our meetings at all. Ever. Especially not the woman. And you? What do you want? I voted to bring you in, she said. We may not always be able to follow your advice, but that doesn't mean we don't need it. Frankly, most of us have seen too much shady shit in our lives to remember what's decent and what isn't half the time. I appreciate your confidence, said Delphine. Eloise lowered her voice so that it no longer reverberated down the hall. When I was your age, she said, still in French, her iron-gray eyes steady on Delphine's. I didn't have someone like me in meeting rooms. If I can ever be of use to you, use me. Her hand came to rest briefly on Delphine's shoulder. Use me? 
an interesting turn of phrase, especially accompanied by physical contact, which was always risky in a professional setting. The elevator gave a soft ding, but Delphine didn't move for it just yet. What I could really use, she said, carefully studying Eloise, is a seat at that table this morning. Eloise let out a small sigh, whether of regret or irritation, Delphine wasn't sure. I'm afraid they had a point about the investigation access. I'm sorry. As much as I value you, you're still a civilian. But I'll tell you what. If you wait for me in the cafe across the street, I'll brief you as well as I can as soon as it's done. Thank you, said Delphine warmly. I appreciate it. She gave Eloise's hand a quick, business-like clasp, and then headed for the elevator, her thoughts wandering. The rare smile, that little shoulder touch, now a one-on-one at a cafe. Was Eloise flirting with her? And if so, would that prove useful in navigating this mess? As soon as Delphine became fully aware of her train of thought, she shook her head at herself in dismay. It seemed Cosima wasn't the only one reverting to habits from darker times. The Happy Helix, a favored watering hole for the Grit staff, was a five-minute walk from what was left of the place. Cosima couldn't help but reflect on the irony of the cheerfully painted sign as she approached the just-opened pub, the hood of her sweatshirt pulled up to cover her telltale hair. The extra caution probably wasn't necessary, but it was better to be too careful than not careful enough. She hadn't bothered with makeup and managed to find an old pair of trial contact lenses, which meant Sturgis himself might not know her right away. Mid-morning wasn't the pub's busiest hour. Maybe the meeting time made Sturgis feel safer, but Cosima considered it a bad move. They'd stand out much more in a nearly empty pub than they would have if they'd just slipped in and tried to blend in with the evening crowd. As soon as she entered the warm, darkly paneled interior of the pub, She realized that blending was completely off the table. Sturgis sat in a corner booth under a framed black and white photo of Rosalind Franklin. He was dressed in mismatched, shabby clothes, sported a pair of cheap sunglasses, and appeared to have dyed his hair a dull, unnatural shade of black off the drugstore shelf. He hadn't done a very good job. As Cosima drew closer, she could see inky smudges around his hairline and ears. He was also working on growing some unflattering stubble that was a good two shades lighter than his current hair. Oh boy, Cosima said as she slid into the booth across from him. I hate to be the one to tell you, but you are really bad at this. Lower your voice, he murmured, barely moving his lips. I think the couple on the other side of the pub might be watching me. I knew I shouldn't have come the minute I walked in. Relax, Nate said Cosima, enjoying the way his shoulders stiffened at the familiarity. What was the appropriate level of formality at a clandestine meeting with someone who faked his own death anyway? The reason everyone... If we're using first names, he interrupted. I prefer Nathaniel. Of course he did. Okay, Nathaniel. The reason they're staring at you is that you look like zombie Elvis. What the hell is going on? Sturgis fidgeted. I thought you'd be happier to see me alive. Oh, for fuck's sake. Cosima let out a long breath between clenched teeth. I'd be happier, she said, if you left me out of this altogether. I can't, he said. You're the only link I have to all of this that I'm pretty sure isn't going to kill me. Oh, come on. Kazima leaned back against the booth and fixed Sturgis with a withering look. First of all, I'm not a link. I wasn't involved in this until you called, and I was fine with that. But you are involved. Why do you think I wanted to hire you? I don't know, but let me tell you how sorry I am that I didn't jump right on that. A server approached the table with a smile. Kasima waved her off as nonchalantly as she could manage under the circumstances. She waited for the woman to pass out of earshot before continuing. Second of all, assuming that it wasn't a freak accident, what makes you think the explosion was meant for you? I... He fidgeted again, not at a hangnail. Right. Who knows why the place blew up? 
But I do know that right before that, a spy nearly broke my arm interrogating me. Kasima blinked. A spy? Wow, this is getting good. Did he introduce himself, James Bond style? Did he show you his spy ID? It was a she, said Nathaniel. Something in his expression, a mixture of unease and excitement, set Kasima's teeth on edge. She was like you. She was one of you. Kasima's mood shifted as though she'd been caught in an icy draft. 324B21. The number floated to the surface of her mind like a dead body in a lake. Her ID number coded right into her DNA. Every cell in her body marked her as patented intellectual property. Sturgis drew in a deep breath. She was... Don't say it, said Kasima. Just tell me how you know, and who else knows? Sturgis scratched a thumbnail along a groove in the wooden table. Not the people I'm working with, I don't think. I... When I started to doubt their motives, I kind of went rogue, I guess you might say. I contacted a a friend, a very highly placed friend. Sturgis paused to take a swallow from his mug. In retrospect, he went on. That may have been a mistake. He waved his hand, pushing away whatever he didn't want to deal with. What he showed me led me to researching Dyad. I started to have suspicions. But I wasn't sure until she showed up. You're crazy lookalike. Her stomach sank. Not Helena, surely. She was up in the Yukon doing survival training with the twins. But what other crazy clone would try to break Sturgis's arm? Cosima's mouth was almost too dry to speak. Did she have a lot of curly blonde hair? No. Red hair. Nose had been broken, I think. That's how I realized she wasn't you. Kasima's mind raced. I don't know anyone like that. I don't... I'm not exactly tight with them all. I never meant to hurt anyone, Sturgis said tensely. I was trying to create a medical breakthrough. You have to believe me. Is there some way to call them off? We're not all one big... Kasima gritted her teeth, exhaled. Look, you're dealing with an individual here, and I don't know her. Whoever she was, she's got her own agenda. Nathaniel, you said you didn't mean to hurt anyone. What is it you've done? It wasn't me. My uh, friend, I guess he wasn't really my friend. He lied about what he was going to do with what I gave him. And the worst of it is, that's nothing to what the people who are actually funding my research might do. He scrubbed a hand over his face. Please, there has to be some way you can contact her, something you can... What were you working on, Sturgis? He stopped, looked at her uncertainly. The bastard had come to her for help and was actually sitting there mulling over how much she was worthy of knowing. She felt her blood pressure rising. Spill it, she said. Right now, or I walk. If you need my help, you'd better make me care. Cosima, running my mouth is what got me into this... She started to slide out of her seat. Sturgis let out a growl of frustration and grabbed her wrist. Wait, he said. Kasima hesitated. Whatever you say next had better be really motivating. For a moment, his eyes were almost feverish. Imagine you found a way to customize phages to any bacteria sample. That was motivating. You'd make antibiotics obsolete. She settled cautiously back into the booth. His eyes glowed. Yes, I knew you would get it. The ecstatic look faded. But now, imagine that the same technology could apply not just to phages, but any virus, which you could target to any genetic marker. Oh my god. Cosima sat back slowly, as though distance would somehow dilute the horror of what she'd heard. A weapon? Kasima realized she was shouting, but what he had just suggested was horrifying. She lowered her tone. A weapon that could target people by their genetics? Designer plagues? Sturgis looked dismayed. I developed this technology to save lives. Tell me you're not that naive. He looked down at his hands for a moment, then said bleakly, Not anymore. Shit, 
Sturgis, this friend of yours. The shattering of a glass broke the pub's sleepy atmosphere and sent Sturgis leaping to his feet. What few heads there were in the bar at that hour all turned in unison from the embarrassed waitress to him. Relax, hissed Kasima. Sit down. I can't be here, he said, reaching for his bag to pull out a ridiculous knit cap, hiding the hair he'd taken so much trouble to dye. He was really just so bad at this. I'll be in touch, he said, if they get me before that. A strained, nervous laugh escaped from him. I've kept what you need close to my chest. Just look for the platinum under my arm. Platinum? Is that code for something? But he was already leaving. Kasima didn't even try to stop him, just lifted a hand in a wry, fatalistic little wave, then leaned her forehead on the heel of her hand. As much as she hated to admit he was right about anything, it was possible he really was in danger. A half-formed idea tickled at the back of her mind. Now there were two unidentified clones, the sick girl and the spy, and Kasima wasn't sure which was weirder. She pulled out her phone, time to compare notes with Charlotte. Kasima? Charlotte sounded tense when she answered. Where are you? When I came upstairs and you weren't here. Kasima glanced around the pub. No one was paying attention to her, but she lowered her voice all the same. I was meeting with Sturgis, who apparently isn't dead. Oh, breathed Charlotte in surprise. That's good, right? Not really. He's dragging me into some bullshit. And I'm wondering, did you see Dana Emmett's spare a dime page was gone this morning? Yes, but I remember it said she was at Lydia Folger Fowler Hospital. That sort of thing is probably exactly why they took the page down. My point is, you and Delphine could go and vaccinate her. I'm looking at flights right now, and they're actually reasonable. Kazima took a moment to recover from her mental whiplash. Flights are reasonable because it's the middle of the week in early November, she said. Grown-ups have jobs, Charlotte, including me and Delphine. Plus, I think our lives just got a lot more complicated. I could go, said Charlotte. Are you high, said Kasima. I'm not letting you go to Boston by yourself. Art would kill me. So send someone with me. Kasima, this woman could be dying. We're the only ones who know how to save her. Kasima felt queasy. She hated that her gut matched Charlotte's on this. Delphine is not going to be okay with this, she said, rubbing at her forehead. There's a flight in a few hours with open seats. By the time Delphine knows about it, I can be on my way. You sure have a lot of confidence in my marriage, kiddo. Blame the whole thing on me if you like said Charlotte. I'm not married to Delphine. Her wrath doesn't frighten me. Cosima reached under her hood to tug a handful of her hair. Just don't get that ticket yet, she said. Give me a chance to find you a travel buddy, okay? Promise me you won't pull the trigger on this unless I say so. I promise. Cosima ended the call and lowered her head onto her arm. Was it too early for a drink? Nah, the pub wouldn't be open if it were. She'd have a drink and a smoke, and once her heart stopped pounding, she'd start figuring all this out. Because while people might flock to Delphine for ethics lessons, when a creepy conspiracy needed unraveling, it was Cosima's time to shine. Art Bell, desk jockey extraordinaire, was at CBSA's lake office filling out paperwork to close out a fentanyl smuggling case when his phone rang. Not the one in his pocket, but the one on his desk. This was a rare enough occurrence that Art sat for a couple of rings, as though whoever was calling would realize their mistake and hang up. Finally, he sighed and answered. Someone from the RCMP here to see you, came the drowsy voice of the office administrative assistant. Art sat ramrod straight in the padded swivel chair where he'd previously been slouching. Long ago years as a police officer had honed his pessimism to a razor's edge. But even to an optimist, the Mounties showing up at what he had deliberately chosen as a low-adrenaline desk job wouldn't bode well. Send them in, Art said. He wondered if he had time to create a makeshift rope from his rubber band ball and escape out the window. 
The morning's calamity came in the form of a petite South Asian woman with an impeccable uniform and neatly pulled back hair. She gave the room an intelligent assessing once-over, and then her eyes landed on Art and lit up as though she'd been dying to meet him. Sergeant Jasera Priyanta with the RCMP, she said. You can call me Jay. His hand nearly swallowed hers when he shook it, and he found himself returning her smile involuntarily. Being disarmed so easily made him edgy as hell. Call me Art, he said, trying not to let his discomfort show. How can I help you? I've been investigating the situation at GRIT. I'm sure you've heard about it. We suspect terrorism, but no organization has come forward. There was blood at the scene, though, and it led me to a case from your days on the police force. Art's stomach began to sink in a familiar way. For some reason, she went on amiably, the files are sealed. All I was able to find were a few names of people who had worked the case, and besides you, they're dead or have really specific amnesia. So what about you? Do you remember Katya Obinger? His stomach stopped sinking and plummeted straight to the building's foundations. How far exactly did he have to run to make that mess go away? Look, Art said, running a hand back over his hair. I really do want to help you in any way I can, but... I'm not on the force anymore. I've got no authority. If they've closed the files, I've got no right to poke around. For the first time, Jay looked uncomfortable, shifting her weight. I'm not asking you to break any rules, she said. But if there's anything at all, any leads you could give me, other old contacts you could put me in touch with, anything you remember about Katya or her death? Art could feel the blood draining from his face, his hands going cold. Obinger's body in that quarry was what had unraveled everything, led him to find out his partner had killed herself and that her clone Sarah Manning had taken her place. The clones had dragged him so far down a conspiracy rabbit hole, he'd thought he'd never get out alive. But he had, damn it. Jay was still talking. Did she have any ties to German terror groups or any history of aggression against research facilities? Art braced himself on the edge of his desk and tried to sort out his thoughts. Too much obvious resistance would just make her push harder. That's what he'd have done in her shoes. But he had to stall her somehow until he worked out exactly how to handle this. I know this must be hard for you, she said in a gentle tone that surprised him into eye contact. She was good. You must have found a new line of work for a reason. But a scientist is missing and may have been killed. The file says Katya Obinger's been dead for years, but her blood was fresh at the scene. I'm trying to make sense of a senseless act, and the evidence only confuses me more. Shit, said Art, rubbing a hand over his eyes. Guilt and fear danced a tango in his gut. There were plenty of living women with Katya Obinger's blood, including his own daughter. If someone targeted this scientist, Jay went on, I need to know why. All I have is a dead woman's blood in the hope that it might lead me to some sort of justice. Surely you remember what that's like. Art did remember, and it wasn't her fault she'd stumbled onto this landmine. But anything he said right now, one wrong word, and he might as well be the one dropping bombs right into the middle of lives he cared about deeply. Can I get back to you? He said carefully. This is from an era of my life I've done my best to forget. And I guess I've done a pretty good job. You're blindsiding me here. Can you give me maybe an hour to pull myself together and try to jog my memory? I'll call you. For a moment, he was sure from the set of her jaw that she was going to refuse. But then she softened. Of course, she said. You know what? I'll go talk with your supervisor, see if she'll let you come to my office and work with me on this. Great. Just great. We're not sure to what extent this was an international incident, she said. But we've already got U.S. intelligence asking us questions for some reason, plus Obinger's involvement. Even if it weren't a potential border security issue, my gut tells me that your old case will be critical. I need your help. She paused, something appealingly earnest in her expression. If you're willing. Of course, he said with a forced smile. See you in a little while. Thank you so much, Art. He nodded, 
kept the smile on his face as he watched her walk away. As soon as she left, he pulled his phone from his pocket and texted Charlotte. We need to talk now. Vivi discreetly prepared a new dressing for her thigh in the front seat of her inconspicuous sedan, wondering what the rental company charged for blood stains. Despite the clean cut, flying glass from the look of it, and last night's masterful suturing, the wound was bothering her more than she could account for as a woman long inured to on-the-job pain. Maybe it was just the stress hormones coursing through her usually icy veins, but better safe than sorry. Today's set of stitches wasn't as elegant as last night's, but she was pretty sure she'd killed all the bacteria in the entire car. As for the blast itself, Vivi was baffled. Could it have been her people not knowing she was there? If so, she was looking forward to telling them that the explosion, and not the researcher's clumsy escape gambit, was the reason she'd lost her quarry. She hadn't chosen just any quiet place to do minor self-surgery. She was keeping an eye on the hip neighborhood where Dr. Niehaus lived, since she was far easier to locate than Sturgis at the moment. Vivi had been expecting this surveillance to be like watching paint dry, but as she was examining her sutures one more time to ferret out the source of the persistent weirdness, a sleek minivan slowed on the approach to the woman's driveway. Vivi quickly taped the dressing on her thigh to free up her hands for her binoculars. Sure enough, the van pulled into the driveway and stopped. A woman with dark brown bangs got out of the driver's side. Vivi shifted forward in her seat and raised her binoculars as bangs stopped to rummage through her purse. That face. The same face. Something inside her twisted. Another memory flash. She was five or six years old sitting on a bed across from one of her pretend Vivi's and playing Mirror. The other girl had tried to copy her movements, then giggled and brushed her bangs out of her eyes when she couldn't keep up. In the present, Vivi watched bangs find what she was hunting for in her mom purse. Was that a boarding pass? It was visible for only a moment, but Vivi was sure of it. She moved her gaze from the document back to the woman's face. For most people, seeing their doppelganger would make their skin crawl, and seeing two would make them think they'd lost their mind. For Vivi, it was more complicated. Her childhood fantasy had been comforting, or so her therapist had helped her understand. She'd felt different from other kids and isolated from her work-obsessed parents. She hadn't yet realized that fitting in didn't matter, that her difference was her strength, so she'd invented a world populated by more of herself so that she wouldn't have to be alone. Bangs was making her way up the front walk toward the house now. Just before she arrived... Another young woman exited, a teenager with a slightly uneven stride. Vivi spotted the outline of a brace over her dark gray leggings. Bangs handed Brace the document she'd been searching for, definitely a boarding pass, and Brace went around to the passenger side of the van. But wait. Vivi raised her binoculars once more briefly and felt a jolt of adrenaline. Again, that face... Even though Brace was easily 20 years younger than Bangs, they were clearly from the same genetic stock. A daughter? Sometimes daughters looked almost eerily like their mothers, but they both looked like Vivi, who wasn't the same age as either of them, and all three of them looked like Kasima Niehaus. Vivi tried to clear her head. Her pounding heart and throbbing leg didn't matter, only the facts. The minivan was pulling away, Were one or both of them suddenly skipping town? Vivi started the car. Her leg would have to wait. Yet another detour she hadn't told Arun about. She needed to update him, but her justification so far had been that she didn't have solid new intel on grit. Her gut had always steered her down solid paths, but as she reflected, she could see that this time the threads she was following were spiraling erratically. The lookalike seemed the easiest link to follow just now, But was it possible her personal curiosity was skewing her priorities? She'd always avoided working in Cuba just to make sure the personal didn't bleed into the professional. And now here she was, literally staring into her own face at every turn. 
She kept at least three cars between herself and the minivan at all times, even though she'd taken care to rent a silver Civic that looked like every third car on the road. Once they were all safely on the expressway, Vivi initiated a hands-free call. Gemstone Marketing Solutions, said a cheery female voice in her ear. I'm calling about the Sapphire plan, Vivi said by rote. One moment, please, said the assistant. A black SUV moved between Vivi and the minivan, blocking her view, so she took a moment to carefully change lanes. She was pretty sure she knew where her quarry would be exiting, but better to keep them in her eyeline. I knew you wouldn't let yourself get blown up, Valdez, murmured Arun in her earpiece. His voice gave Vivi a pleasant little shiver. What happened in there? I take it the fireworks weren't yours, Vivi said dryly. And someone else has joined the game. I got out of there just before it blew. Learn anything while you were in? Yes, Arun, I'm fine. Only nearly sliced my leg off on the way out, thanks for asking. But of course, he knew she was fine. He didn't like to waste time. I learned quite a bit. The weapon is called TAG. From what I saw in the files, it's a weapon that somehow uses genetics in targeting. Targeting for what? Maybe that illness? Arun was silent for a second. And the explosion? No idea. Maybe someone else is trying to get control of this weapon. But there's something else. Ni House, the adjunct he interviewed not long before. She hesitated. Should she tell him about the lookalikes? Was it possible she was having some sort of psychotic break based on her suppressed childhood fantasies? Valdez? If I'm losing my mind, better for national security if Arun knows, right? She looks exactly like me. Sangara, she said. As do the two people I'm following to what I'm pretty sure is the airport. Arun was silent on the other end of the line. Sangara, did I lose you? I'm here, he said, warm as always. She let out her breath in relief. I just have zero answers on this. You okay? That's gotta be. Wow. This was the closest to rattled she'd ever heard him, but he didn't seem to be going distant the way he did when she screwed up. The opposite, even. I'm peachy, she said flatly, currently tailing my doppelgangers to the airport, going to look for a good place to hear where they're going without being spotted. I'll look into this doppelganger thing, said Arun. I've got plenty of threads I can pull from this end. I'll let you know as soon as I find anything. All right, she said, ending the call now. She had to end it because suddenly she was shaking all over and she didn't want him to hear it in her voice. Kira showed up at the headquarters of the nonprofit Jean Keep after lunch to check in for her first day orientation. If she had any chance of getting into a top college after being forced to school herself via correspondence her last year of high school, she was going to need something spectacular on her application. An IT internship at a genetics-focused nonprofit might as well be an invite with her name on it. There was a lot she could learn here about herself, too, without revealing why she was interested and without putting herself in danger of becoming a lab rat again. Walking into Jean Keep's fresh scrubbed lobby, knowing she was the youngest person in the building, she couldn't decide between pride and panic. Dragging her suitcase behind her added another level of awkwardness, she wasn't exactly sure where she was going to spend the night. Cosima and Delphine couldn't be trusted not to report her every move to her mom, and there was no way she was staying at that creepy hostel again. She was surprised to see a chic, heavy-set girl not much older than she was at the reception desk. Her hair was dark brown with gold streaks, done in complicated braids, and she had freckles and lively dark eyes. Her makeup and jewelry game was strong, Kira was suddenly all too aware of how little time she spent in front of mirrors. But then the girl spotted Kira, and her entire face lit up as though a knight had ridden in through the door in shining armor. You're here, she said. Kira stopped awkwardly. Had she gotten the time wrong? The girl laughed immediately and added, You've been here 30 seconds and I'm already freaking you out. Sorry, I'm a little excited at having another young person here finally. The others are nice, but I'm sure you know how it is. Hi, was all Kira managed. 
Hi, I skipped that, didn't I? Sorry, I'm Emmeline Francis, junior community liaison. You can call me M. And you're Kira? That's right. Are you ready for the tour? We should find somewhere to put your bag. She stopped then, a line appearing between her well-groomed brows. Have you not had a chance to stop by the place you're staying yet? Do you need more time? It's fine, said Kira. My, uh, my friend's house is locked up until evening. I can just stash my bag somewhere for now, if that's okay. It's fine, said M, hunting through the desk drawers. I know just the place for it, if I can find the... Ah, here. She withdrew a small brass key and handed it to Kira. Follow me. Kira followed her down a well-lit hallway strewn with pictures of famous scientists and group shots of smiling people Kira couldn't identify. There were windows looking into some of the offices, though the one with the founder's name on the door, Dr. Parker Bai, didn't have a view inside. Kira peeked into the windows as they passed. A diverse collection of people, all dressed way better than Kira, she now realized, went busily about their work. She couldn't hear what they were discussing, but their expressions were animated. Kira had learned to read body language by necessity, and everything she saw here gave her good vibes. So... She asked Em, how long have you worked here? This is my second year, she said. I love it. I hope you stay too. I couldn't believe it when I read that essay of yours. How did you learn so much about genetics in high school? I'm acing a human genetics test and I still had to look up some of the stuff you were talking about. Kind of a hobby, I guess, said Kira. I'm a nerd. Really? You look like a badass, said Em and then immediately smacked herself on the forehead. Wow, I'm pretty sure don't comment on coworkers' looks is on page one of the employee manual. It's okay, said Kira, pleased but baffled by the badass thing. Was that code for no makeup and messy hair? I put my foot in my mouth all the time, she reassured Em. Great, it'll be nice not to be the problem child anymore. So what made you decide to work at Gene Keep anyway? It certainly wasn't the pay. For some reason, maybe because she was so tired, Kira almost told her the truth. Because there aren't many places I'd want to work that would hire a self-schooled 17-year-old alleged delinquent. Also, because I can get hit full speed by a car and walk out of the hospital the same day. And I want to know if that can help someone besides just me. I love the vision behind it, she said instead. Half-truths were old habit by now. When I saw Gene Keep's website, it was a no-brainer. Was it the cheesy castle motif or Dr. Bai's touchy-feely mission statement? Em laughed. That's him, by the way. It's not an act or a PR thing. He's hilariously idealistic, and honestly, it's infectious. I mean, he just talked the people of Nasqueen Egg into donating genetic data. Do you have any idea how hostile they've been to us? For years. Dr. Bai has one meeting with their leader in person, and suddenly they're best buddies. Not surprised, Kira said. Cheesy as it was, Bai's little essay about preserving rare genomes really hit home with me. I think of rare genes kind of like endangered species, or cultures, or languages. Fragile things that take millions of years to evolve and shouldn't be allowed to just die out before we even understand them. Oh, M stopped and put a hand to her heart. I wish I had your way with words. That's exactly how I feel. She gave Kira a shy smile. I'm Métis, and as much as I love mainstream pop culture and all that, it's always been so important to me to stay in touch with my family's traditional language and customs because there's no other heritage exactly like ours, and if we let things like that slip away... I'm babbling again, sorry. Actually, said Kira, I was interested to see where you were going with that. To Kira's surprise, she thought she saw a blush creeping across Em's face under her freckles. She hoped she hadn't embarrassed her somehow. Don't screw this up, Kira. We can get acquainted later, Em said, turning away to continue down the hall. Here you can see uh, some of the different offices, obviously. Oh, and that door over there without the windows, that's our fitness center. It's just a treadmill and a shower, but it's awesome. It can really help your brain get out of a rut. 
And here, at the end of the hall, your storage closet. Should be plenty of room for your bag. They keep it locked now because last year a couple of employees got caught doing the naked pretzel in there. Uh, former employees. Dr. Bai is pretty chill, but he's not that chill. I'll try to avoid on-the-job nudity, Kira said dryly as she tried the key in the door. She immediately regretted her words. She was way too tired to be talking. Em just grinned. Don't you hate it when you accidentally find yourself naked in a closet at work? Said Em. It's the worst. Totally, said Kira in relief. She eased the door open to reveal an incredibly roomy storage space. In fact, she'd slept in smaller rooms, which made her wonder. Would Em notice if she didn't give back the key at the end of the day? What do you think, said Em. Is that okay for your bag? It's perfect, she said. And for the first time in a very long time, she felt a huge, goofy smile spreading across her face. Everything about this place is absolutely perfect. This time, Em definitely blushed. The security line at Pearson was never exactly speedy in Charlotte's experience, but this was really something else. They put up some kind of screens, making it hard to see what the holdup was at the checkpoint, but it looked like they were going to be in line a while. Unfortunately, Kasima had stuck to her insistence on a chaperone, and the only person with time on her hands had been Aunt Allison. Allison was a good person, but to put it diplomatically, she was extremely uncomfortable with anyone but herself making decisions. She'd insisted on organizing Charlotte's purse for her in the car, and at the moment she was looking particularly smug because the egregious delay at security served as justification for how ridiculously far ahead of departure time she'd insisted on picking Charlotte up from Cosima's place. Charlotte's phone buzzed. She checked it and winced. Her dad again. It was getting to the point where if she kept ignoring him, he was going to go full cop on her, so she'd have to find some way to put him off her scent for a few days. Hey, Dad, what's up? She said casually, hoping the airport PA wouldn't start blaring mid-conversation. This is what she got for not answering his texts. Where are you right now? He said. Hanging out with Aunt Allison, she said. Allison? He said incredulously. Why would... Never mind. Look, I need you to not come back home for a little while. He said. Well, that wouldn't be a problem. What's up? Charlotte said. Everything okay? It's this grit bombing. He said. Apparently they found blood at the scene and... Damned if I know how, but somehow it's a clone's. What? I don't know. Katya Obinger popped up when they ran the DNA, which led them to me. There's a Mountie who's decided I'm her new best friend, and I've had to play nice. She might show up at the house randomly. I'll stay away, Charlotte said. I should warn the others, too. Just lay low for a while, all of you, he said. Everyone and their brother's trying to find Katya. And because she was German, they're going all international on this. The Mounties are poking into my old files. Our people are doing cheek swabs at airports now. And Jay, uh, the Mountie, she just told me she thinks security measures are going to escalate even more. Cheek swabs? Charlotte repeated, her eyes drifting toward the screens at the security checkpoint. Yeah, at airports, checking for DNA matches to Katya or those Quebecois separatists they're trying to pin it on. Oh, shit said Charlotte, her blood running ice cold. Allison's head snapped up at the foul language, but her look of irritation changed to one of alarm when she saw Charlotte's face. Oh, shit is right, said Art. Promise me you'll steer clear of cops until this investigation cools down. I promise, she said numbly. Charlotte pocketed her phone and turned to Allison. Keeping her voice as quiet as she could, she said, The line is slow because they're testing people's DNA to see if it matches the DNA of some people from one of Dad's old cases. You know, the case he worked with, Beth? Allison's lips compressed into a thin line as she inhaled a long, slow breath through her nose. 
Well, she said primly, shit. Once Aunt Allison started using swear words, you knew you were about two steps away from the apocalypse. All right, Allison said briskly, putting her hands on Charlotte's shoulders. This is fine. Don't panic. For a moment, Charlotte was afraid Allison was going to start shaking her, but instead she abruptly let go. Well, we'll just... Excuse us, sir. Excuse us. She began to push her way back through the stanchion maze, pulling her carry-on behind her. Wonderful. Charlotte muttered as person after person stepped aside for them, scowling. Now there are about 50 people who will remember us for hours. She tried to become invisible. Do you have a better idea, smarty pants? Ellison hissed between clenched teeth. Once they were finally free of the line, it was all Charlotte could do not to break into the fastest run her new exoskeleton would allow. But that would draw more attention, so she forced herself to stay behind her power-walking aunt as they rounded a corner and... Allison stopped so abruptly, Charlotte ran into her back. Standing in front of them was a security guard, clutching the arm of a ghastly pale, sweaty, red-haired woman. A clone Charlotte had never seen before in her life. It was hard to tell if the guard was detaining the clone or keeping her from falling down. Maybe both. Her pant leg was stained with dark red blood. What the hell? The guard looked as stunned at their arrival as Charlotte felt, and the red-headed clone took advantage of his distraction to wrench her arm away and take off for the exit at a limping run. Charlotte stood for a moment feeling numb and stupid with shock. And then Allison stabbed a dramatic, accusatory finger after the redhead. My sister stole my ID! She said, in the sort of high-pitched squawk that propelled service people like arrows. The security guard took off after the fugitive. Allison grabbed Charlotte's wrist and hauled her off toward a different exit. What is even happening right now? Charlotte gasped as she tried to keep up with her fleeing aunt. I have no idea. Allison's stage whispered breathlessly as she lugged Charlotte with one hand, her carry-on with the other. As they burst out through the airport exit and toward the parking garage, Charlotte felt like she might be sick. As shocking as it was to run into a random clone, that wasn't the worst of it. Where were they supposed to go now? How was she supposed to carry on her life, let alone save a dying clone, if the feds were hunting for her DNA? You're listening to Orphan Black, the next chapter. Starring Tatiana Maslany. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Orphan Black, the next chapter is written by Malka Older, Lindsay Smith, Madeline Ashby, Michelle Baker, E.C. Myers, and Helly Kennedy. Produced by Marco Palmieri and executive produced by Molly Barton, Julian Yap, David Fortier, Ivan Shebeg, and Carrie Appleyard. In partnership with Boat Rocker Media and BBC America. Audio produced, sound designed, and edited by Amanda Rose Smith. Based on the television series Orphan Black. Produced by Temple Street, a division of Boat Rocker Studios. The theme music is by Two Fingers. <laughs>